Okay, let's, um, we've got some, a little cleanup. We're gonna start with April. Um, you got this one page document. Um, it's got House Bill 983 and 327 on there. And we're gonna, April will explain what this is. Hello. Um, okay, so House Bill 983, this is hunting, wildlife, conservation, and outdoor recreation, funding, promotion, management, licenses, permits, and stamps. Um, this was on a consent calendar last week, and I missed, there was actually a very small difference between the, the House bill and the Senate bill, so I just wanted to point it out and make sure it doesn't change anybody's vote. Um, you can see, so this is the part of the bill that was dealing with the um, plan to address overpopulation of deer in the state. The House amendment struck this entire clause so it says the final version of their final version says the plan shall include the feasibility of implementing a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land struck including state park system lands and hunting on state lands on Sundays the senate version was nearly identical um, but only struck the and hunting on state land on Sundays leaving in that state park system um the department would prefer the the house version so if people are good with the house version we can keep the favorable report it just won't be on a consent calendar for the floor um, but i wanted to point that out and make sure okay senator carroza so just on the background of this bill this is the original bill that had the hunting licenses and fees and it included um, buried in that bill the uh, Sunday hunting for migratory birds. It wasn't buried, which, but it was in that which, bill, yes. <laughs> which ended up being struck. Correct. But are you saying this language about a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land? That was in the original language? Yes. So the original bill includes a provision. It's requiring the Department of Natural Resources in consultation with the Department of Agriculture to develop a plan to address deer overpopulation. And so the original part of that bill said feasibility of implementing a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land, including state park system lands and hunting on state land on Sundays. Both versions, the Senate and the House, struck the, the Sunday provision. Um, the House also struck the state park provision. As a reminder, currently hunting is at least not open to the public on state parks anywhere in the state. So when it says the feasibility, so you've, you've got the focus on a plan to address overpopulation overall for DNR to look at. So recognizing that the overpopulation of deers are causing problems statewide. And then it says the plan shall include the feasibility, the feasibility of implementing a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land. What is the current status? My understanding is currently some state lands, right? And we're talking about not state parks, some natural resources management areas, for example, are open to Sunday hunting or not, sorry, not Sunday so hunting, are open hunting. to hunting and some are not. This would be to look at potentially opening up additional state lands on a rotational basis, for example, for hunting deer as part of this deer management strategy. So we're directing, D we're recognizing that DNR, um, we're directing DNR to do this study because we recognize that um, there's an overpopulation of deer and at the same time saying, well, we also want you to look at possibly closing some of the hunting areas that are already, that have already been approved. That is not my understanding of what this is. This is about. When he says the feasibility of implementing a rotational closure hunting strat, I'm really trying to understand what the words mean. Okay. I mean, I, if you want to talk to the department, we can try to pull this off the report, but this has been in the bill since the bill was and introduced. I, I, I think I missed, once I heard the, my, the Sunday hunting for migratory birds was removed, I did not realize this was in there. And I guess I'm trying to understand it because I, I understand addressing the overpopulation of deer, but this other language about 
implementing a rotational closure hunting strategy on state land, that seems to imply that you would be considering taking away some of the hunting that has already been approved in the past. And I would oppose that. Okay, that's not my understanding of what the goal of this is, but you would have to talk to the department to understand more specifically what they're planning on, you know, what the, how, how they plan to approach this. Mr. Chair, do we have time for clarification? Sure. Just give me the posture just so we're clear. Well, so we, we voted this favorably, but again, on a consent calendar, because I thought this, this bill and this provision was identical to the Senate version. Um, so we can pull it off the report and delay reporting it, or we can move the report you know, continue the report going, but, um, and you can talk to them. It wouldn't be on a report until tomorrow. Okay. So, um, again, we voted a cons on a consent because we thought it was identical and there is this one deviation. So the question, uh, is, um, does this make a difference if it's, uh, on a Tuesday report or a Wednesday report? Probably not so much. So Sarah Carosa, You've raised an issue. I don't want to sort of jam this. I think that, again, um, I don't know that the one day we're in double sessions. I will say this. We're probably going to have a double session tomorrow. And so we don't have to be in the, was this destined to be, intended to be on the morning session, session one? Or? Sure, but it's, uh, you can do whatever you want to do. Okay, well, if we bump this to what I think will be a second session tomorrow that will give you between now and tomorrow afternoon at some point to find out and get some clarity from the department about that issue. I don't think that materially changes kind of the trajectory of the bill, whether it's on session one or session two. So I think let's just second session. Okay, but we're good with the favorable report. Yeah, yeah. Okay, with that said, let's go to um, voting list number 31. Um, let's start with the Educator Shortage Act, Stacy, because I think that one, um, there's a lot of consensus, a lot of work went behind the scenes on this bill. So I think the House and the Senate and the governor somewhat aligned at this point. So um, Stacy, why don't we start with that uh, House Bill 1219? Sure. House Bill, uh, House Bill 1219, the Maryland Educator Shortage uh, Act of 2023. So this administration bill makes a number of changes related to the recruitment and retention of teachers, including pre-kindergarten teachers. I'm going to leave it uh, very broad like that because there are one set of amendments. You have it and a chart there that says um, the Maryland Educator Shortage Act. Um, and then there's a packet of standalone amendments. And there is an actual reprint of the amendments uh, starting on page uh, seven of your packet. And I'll just go through the various things that are in there. Um, I've broken this down into as the introduced by the administration, what the House amendments did and what the Senate amendments do. Um, so the first uh, provision in here is an alter alternative teacher prep programs. The administration uh, bill altered the definition uh, the department was authorized to establish an alternative teacher prep program. It authorized the department to develop criteria for early childhood learning, and a program participant was authorized to satisfy criteria in lieu of having a teacher practicum, and that criteria is related to their prior learning experience in early childhood. The House Amendment struck all of that, and the Senate Amendment in front of you puts that back in except for allowing the department to establish a program. The purpose of that being that we can't have the department uh, approving their own program. So the, the second provision in there for teacher prep programs was recruitment and retention goals. Um, the administration bill set up a teacher preparation program requirement that they do establish these recruitment and retention goals and had a plan that if they failed to meet these goals, they were required to submit an action plan to the department. Um, the House amendments kind of watered this down a little bit and said they have to establish in consultation with the Maryland Higher Education Commission, and it requires the institution to work with the teacher preparation program that fails to meet the goals to develop this action plan. Um, the Senate amendment accepts these House amendments. 
the Maryland Educator Recruitment, Retention, and Diversity Dashboard. It's uh, the administration bill created a dashboard information regarding classroom educators and teacher preparation program prospective educators. And county boards are required to report specific demographic information to the department by December 1. The House amendments clarified various provisions in there. Um, the Senate amendments just accept these House amendments. With regard to the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact, the bill as originally introduced had the Maryland General Assembly intent language to join the compact. Uh, the House Amendment strikes just from the bill. The Senate amendments accept that House Amendment in that, as you are all aware, this is not the way to do compacts. Compacts have to be, the entire language has to be brought into the law for consideration because there may be some conflict with existing state law and members need to review that and look at that and make their determination as to whether, so only the MGA can accept a compact. It can't be the intent that the department accept the provisions of that compact. Um, the next provision is a high quality staff qualifications for pre-kindergarten teachers. Uh, the administration bill provides an alternative pathway through alternative teacher preparation program. The House amendments strike this administration provision and provides for alternative credentials by meeting specified, ch specified child care provider educational criteria from July 1, 2025, the length of employment and an MSD assessment. Um, the Senate amendments strike all of that, and instead it moves the blueprint implementation date for um, high quality staff qualifications for pre-K teachers to 2027-2028 school year instead of the 2025-2026 school year. I can say there's going to be language in the budget that's going to study this particular issue. The AIB will come and they will talk about um, the various issues related to child care and the very aggressive timelines for uh, pre-K teachers. The next is the Hoffman LARP program to extend it to public school mental health professionals. This was not in the original bill. Uh, the House added this. It added mental health professionals that serve in public schools to, to the eligibility for the Hoffman LARP, the LARP program. And it also renamed the program to be the Nancy Grasmus Public School Professional Award versus just teachers. Um, the Senate amendment just conforms it to Senate Bill 482 as passed this session by the Senate, and that includes two years of employment or service and accepts the renaming from the House amendments. The next provision is the Teaching Fellows for Maryland Scholarship Program. The original administration bill transferred the administration to the Department of Education. Uh, it altered program requirements, including striking the Maryland residence or a high school graduation requirement, the minimum GPA, and had a minimum standardized testing score. All of those were stricken. It alters service obligation requirements. It reduced the, the current mandatory appropriation to $10 million from $18 million and required publicizing the focus of the publication of this program at HBCUs. The House amendments strike transfer, strike transfer of the program to MSDE and it now and it stays within the Office of Student Financial Assistant. It strikes the new administration eligibility requirements and instead puts in a baseline eligibility of satisfactory progress toward degree completion and meeting the institution requirements. The award preference to currently employed teachers. It clarifies the service obligation requirements. It restores the mandatory appropriation to $18 million and adds um, the public, I can't say that word, publicizing focus to current education support uh, staff working in public schools and public pre Ks, as well as at HBCUs. The Senate uh, accepts those House amendments. The next program in this bill was called Grow Our Own Educators Scholarship with a Related Fund. And this program established a program, established a program focused on providing support to individuals whose intent to work in public schools if they are Maryland residents and enrolled in a teacher prep program in the state or an alternative teacher preparation program. The House Amendment strike this program. 
and uh, the Senate accepts this. They also, the original bill had an educator internship stipend program, which established program to provide stipends to student teachers participating in an internship or teacher training practicum of up to 20,000 for 10 month internship struck by the house amendments accepted in these amendments. Um, and there's been negotiations between the house and the, the governor's office and um, the house put in this next program I'm going to describe. And, and that was the, the teaching fellow scholarship got a different focus. So not only did the HBCUs, it also comes into a kind of a grow our own and gives more money to um, people currently employed in, in public schools and then going back to get a degree. So it's, it's changing course a little bit and that's part of the reason. And then the final program in here was the teacher development and retention program. This was not in the original bill. This was added by the House amendments and establishes a six year pilot program to incentivize a cohort of students to pursue a teaching career. They must teach in a high, high need school as identified by the department, a grade level or content area with a shortage of teachers. Uh, the increasing level of support upon the individual who participates on fulfilling certain components of the program, the initial stipend to participate in an, ex in an experiential learning opportunity in public school or public pre-K program, and continues getting annual financial support when they show progress and commitment to a teaching career, and eligibility is enrollment in an institution of initial eligibility. Um, the only amendment to that program was uh, in the Senate ones is altering that definition of institution of initial eligibility slightly. Okay, so folks, obviously it's the governor's bill. There a lot of some puts and takes and some back and forth with the governor and the legislative branch on this um, compromise. I would characterize the consensus bill from the governor, but that said, uh, we're an independent entity here and questions, Senator Washington. So I just want to uh, better understand the institutions of eligibility because there was about three of those. Put your mic a little, oh. a little closer. Yeah. I'd like to better understand because so there's a, a a new a new program. I guess we'll start from the end. A, a new program that was created is funded at how much? Let's see here. So there's a fund attached to it. And I don't, I don't know if there's any mandatory funding, but I think it's funding as in the budget. Okay. And then, what, yeah, since this is new, can you explain who this is for? Um, I mean, is it the, is it what was the Grow Our Own Educator Scholarship, and now it's the teacher? development retent i'm on page 23 of the uh, well let me look at the yours uh so i had my notes in my original one uh yeah so it is still a page 31 of the reprint um right so who's the so the focus right, of this program is, is a is a recruitment and retention so they're giving preference to applicants. On page 32 of your reprint, it says in lines 25 through 29, the office shall give preference to applicants who've been employed in a public school or a publicly funded pre-kindergarten program within the last five years. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to give financial to support people who have shown an interest already in career and education mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, to give them, as they move along in the process, to give them increasing financial support. <laughs> And then the institutions of institution of initial eligibility. What does that mean exactly? So essentially, let me find the definition here. That's on page 31 of your reprint here. Mm -hmm. So an institution of initial eligibility line six through eight means an institution of higher education in the state where at least 40% of the attendees receive federal Pell Grants. Mm -hmm. So it's not any institution, it's, there's, it narrows it down a bit to, uh, to make sure that we're getting it to more uh, cohort of needier students. Mm -hmm. And so is it, uh, so this is private or public, is that? 
I guess that's it's one either. is any. Mm -hmm. um, so 40% is kind of high for um, a lot of our institutions where there might be eligible students like, you know, who would be very interested. Do you know if there was any discussion about, I would hope to get it to move that down. And so committee, I would, if, if we got it to like 30%, um, then there would be more uh, universities that would qualify uh, and more students who could possibly have an interest. Agreed. I think so, the this language here was negotiated to include, make sure that HBCUs were specifically included in this mm -hmm. and to focus on those institutions first mm -hmm. and see how the program started, worked. And I'm getting information that there was, let's see here, $10 million added to the budget for the new stipend program. Should the budget So, pass. So for example, that would not, so um, an institution that, I attended and a lot of folks attend who may be interested that 40% would not make me eligible. So, and if I'm attending, a, if say I'm middle income or low income and I'm attending a school that has a higher uh, income, then I may in fact, may need the support more and interested. So um, would be interested to see if we can you know, that's a policy that. decision for the committee to make. Well, again, I, I don't want to slow down the governor's bill unless if you have a very, you know, a specific idea for a potential amendment, I guess one other possibility here would be between now and when we, if we were to vote this bill out, understanding we go to the floor, if you want to have a conversation with the governor, a floor yeah, amendment may be appropriate. I, yeah, rather I, than I do, kind I, of delay yeah, it for I, that last week here, so I'm a little bit. Uh, you no, know. I sorry, I, right. I didn't. Um, I I think I thought that that would have been accepted. That was my understanding. There were, were conversations about this. Um, I I do think there are well qualified people who, and I, I get wanting to prioritize, but even when I do the math on the need, um, we don't we don't have enough, you know, at those schools. So I just would like us to consider it. So I don't want to slow the bill down. I'll have some conversations, but yeah, I think, think uh, if we move uh, the reason down, I say I thought I saw somebody, uh, I thought safe from the governor's office was, was actually, yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. So we actually, so yeah, what I would, what I was going to suggest and safe is here is maybe when we're done here, why don't you, let's get it. Why don't you get a yeah. conversation going through safe with the governor's office and get to the floor you know, rather than just no, no, kind of winging yeah. it here, I'd Absolutely. rather not wing it here. I just wanted the whole yeah. committee to hear that I think, well, you know, it, it eliminates it some people that would need it and who would be uh, good for role models for our students. Okay, let's, any additional mm -hmm. questions, let's just get them all out here and, you know, we'll, we'll see where we are. Um, yes, Senator Gallium and, and then Senator Kagan after that. I was re-looking through the testimony. I, I saw a letter info from the community colleges. Was that addressed in any of the amendments there, kind of questions? Um, yep. Um, and let me find the... They say some students come to them with two years removed from high school or may have been a circumstance where their high school GPA is not reflective of their growth at the community college, which are currently not eligible institutions as written and whose transcripts cannot be considered in student eligibility. So I didn't know if that was addressed. That the amendments are pretty extensive. I didn't know if that. It, no. Senator Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me just start with, this is a really important bill that I am proud to be co-sponsoring, and I thank the governor and his team for the initiative and the thoughtfulness. Um, I have a couple of questions, and Stacy, on page 31 uh, and everywhere, uh, the Teacher Development and Retention Fund, and as I am trying to speed read this version that we were just given, um, and thank you for doing it, uh, just to be clear, uh, there's a lot of while you're studying, we're going to give you a 
a, um, a stipend and we want you to become a teacher and we're going to have you work for two years and all that. I'm not seeing a lot in retention. Am I missing that? Where are the where are the aspects that are specifically related to retaining our current teachers who are struggling and unhappy and threatening? Well, to I leave? think it's a both. It's not just a it's not just new. It's you're already a uh, educate support person in a school and you're working and you go back to get your teaching degree. This is a retention in the education field. You could be going back to get your master's degree. That could be something that could be included in that as well. Is there anything in this for the seventh grade teacher who's having a heck of a time in a presumably ish post COVID uh, atmosphere and struggling and thinking about leaving and going to do something totally different? Because to me, that's what retention means. How do we keep teachers who are currently in our classrooms? Yes, let's bring more people in. Yes, let's get our uh, support staff uh, to shift and become teachers. But what about those who are already teachers? I don't think those are addressed in here. Safe? Anything? I mean, I'm not sure how we call it retention if we're not retaining. Okay, that may, that may be a, an academic question, but I think it's pretty important. And I can't tell you the number of teachers who are counting the days until retirement or are just out of here. They are checked out the kids are the students. Sorry, not kids. The students are have had their challenges. There are they're acting out. Their mental health challenges. There's anxiety and depression, as we all know. There's insufficient number of school counselors. I mean, everything we all know. And I think it's a really important policy aspect that we've got to be thinking about. So, I don't know if there's a conversation to be had later, but um, let me just shift. Um, so the way I read this, going to pages 34 and 35, um, lines 24 through 27 on page 34, and then again, lines 11 through 14 um, uh, on page 35, engage in an internship or practicum providing direct experience working with students in a public school or publicly funded pre-K program. Um, as part of the recipient's course of study. So that can be at any level in a public school, can be K through 12, or it can be pre-K. Okay, so there's no thumb on the scale pushing them in one direction or another. Okay, and then the last thing I just wanna check in on, on page 35, lines 24 through 27, if the recipient doesn't do what they say they're gonna do, they're gonna repay the funds received. So if they've been getting $20,000 a year for a few years. I assume that would be done through regs. I assume that MSDE, that the superintendent and the board would figure out how to squeeze blood from a turnip here, uh, because if they don't pursue that career, how do they possibly pay back um, tens of thousands of dollars? The way it works now with others, for example, LARP programs where they have a service obligation, they sign a promissory note, and that's a contract that basically says, I agree to fulfill all the obligations in order to receive this funding. And if they don't, then they have to pay back. So I assume there's a payment plan or whatnot that can be set up, or I don't know. Right now, there's no language in statute about waiver. I don't know if that's an option. So is there anything about that promissory note or anything that is in this bill or should be? I assume that's administrative. If you have a service obligation and you're required to repay, they have to make a mechanism for that to, to come about. And uh, that the traditional one, the one that used to be attached to promise before that was taken out was a promise area. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, additional questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, does anybody wanna move the amendments to the governor's bill here? Um, Senator Augustine, is there a second? There's a second uh, from Senator Washington. Okay, uh, it's an important bill. So let's just, we're gonna do a roll call both on the amendments and then the bill as amended. So uh, Lamoria, why don't we just okay. go around the horn on this one? Okay, Senator Kagan. Um, I'm gonna vote yes, but I want to, um, I wanna just be on the record saying that we really must add language about and, and, um, and programmatic something, financial incentive, something about retaining our current educators. 
So I don't know if that's a floor amendment after a conversation with the governor's folks or what that looks like, but I think that's critically important. And if we try to get new folks in and aren't keeping the current folks, we are going to be in deep doo-doo. Thank you. Okay, I just would encourage, we'll, let's go around the horn. If, if you have some amendment ideas, again, then this will have to then go back to the House of Delegates. And, and just to be clear, uh, if that's something, some conversation, and you say if you're hearing this conversation, um, we want to make sure that we have some buy-in from the House. Otherwise, we could run out of time, and I don't want that to happen. So that said, uh, Lamoria, let's continue the roll call. All right. Senator Kagan was a yes. Senator Augustine? Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion? Uh, yeah. I would, as we go through this, I know this is on the amendments, but uh, I just like to take a little deeper look at that community college thing too. But so for now, I'm yes, but hey, we could tighten that up. All right, Senator Gallion was a yes. Senator Watson? Yes. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young? Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? Yes. And to echo the community college concerns as well. Senator Carrozza was a yes. Senator Hester? And I would support you know, Senator Chair Kagan's idea. All right. Senator Hester was a yes. Senator Washington? A yes. And also to explain my vote, uh, similarly, community college, what Sen Senator Kagan had, uh, as well as that there are uh, perhaps looking at uh, students who are Pell eligible um, and, and, and enabling whoever wants to serve, no matter where they go, uh, to be able to participate. But for now, this is a great start. All right, Senator Washington was a yes. Senator Simonair? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Simonair, yes. Senator Feldman? Okay, simple yes from, from, from me as well. Um, okay, so the amendments carry unanimously. We have uh, House Bill 1219 as, as amended, favorable from Sir Augustine, uh, second from Sir Washington. Let's do another roll call on this one, and then we'll move on. All right, Senator Kagan? Aye, same thing. Senator Kagan, yes. Senator Augustine? Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion? Yes. Senator Gallion, yes. Senator Watson? Aye. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young? Yes. Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? Yes. Senator Carosa, yes. Senator Hester? Yes. Senator Hester, yes. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Washington, yes. Senator Simonair? Yes. Senator Simonair, yes. And Senator Feldman? Yes, uh, that right. bill carries unanimously. Uh, House Bill 1219. Next, let's go to, um, we've got two energy storage bills here uh, from Senator Augustine and Delegate Fraser Doggo. And uh, you should have a document on your uh, table here that sort of uh, compares the two bills, the different amendments. And I'm going to Turn it to you, Alexis, and then after that, uh, Sarah Augustine would like to weigh in with some other commentary. So why don't we start with you, Alexis, on, again, we're on Senate Bill 697 and House Bill 910, uh, energy storage um, is the topic. Okay, so broadly, the two bills require the Public Service Commission to establish the energy um, storage program for the deployment of energy storage technology. The way the bills deal with that metric and the ultimate number are a little different. So starting with the left of the chart, uh, we begin with the House amendments that have been adopted. We have Senate sponsor amendments. We also have a Senate co-sponsor amendment on committee from um, Senator Hester. We also have House amendments to the House bill that are sponsored by the House um, sponsor. And those are the, those are the three maybe four. So we'll, we'll start uh, with this first, with the first. And, and Alexis, column. could I just interrupt? There's this one page, but on the back, there is this, uh, you could see okay. key differences between Senate sponsor amendments and House sponsor mm -hmm. amendments, just to sort of crystallize the issue on the back page, on the back side, just to, so back to you, Alexis. Yeah. So the amendments to the House bill that are incorporated into the, the Senate bill change changes the way that the ultimate goal is measured from megawatt hours to megawatts. It also specifies the type of energy storage that's permissible, creates an inclusive of definition um, to include various types. The House amendments and the Senate sponsor amendments before us remove the requirement that a power purchase agreement be used to reach the storage capacity. So instead of prescribing how um, the capacity is is procured. 
the utility companies have a little bit more flexibility. So the House amendments authorize a program to be cost effective. This is where the Senate um, sponsor amendments conflict and where the House amendments that are proposed also conflict. So this is this one, two, three, four, this fourth row is, is sort of a, a key distinction here. So the Senate amendments require cost effectiveness broadly and require utility companies to apply for federal and state funding and incentives, rebates, et cetera. The House amendments that have been proposed by the Senate sponsor build off of that slightly. It incorporates this onus um, on a utility uh, company to apply for state and federal fundings, rebates and incentives, and also requires the Public Service Commission to view this through the lens in a, a approving projects um, through the lens of cost effectiveness. However, specific to the House, the House sponsors amendments, um, there has to be a specific cost effective focus on climate change and health impacts. So that's a difference between the Senate sponsor amendments because it is not as maybe narrowly um, tailored with respect to what cost effectiveness has to look at. So that's one, one key question before us. Across the um, board, the House amendments required the program to be adopted by July 1st, 2025. The Senate sponsor amendments delay this implementation um, by or to July 1st of 2025. That is not a conflict with the um, House sponsor amendments. In general, the House amendments that were brought before us on third reader require the um, codified targets to be met. However, the Senate sponsor amendments allow a company to reach the highest possible energy capacity that is cost effective, even if that target is not met. That is the same with the um, House amendments incorporated into the House sponsors amendments. And if that distinction is confusing, please let us know. The, the bill, it may have been helpful to just say the House bill instead of the House sponsor um, amendments, but that change is also incorporated in the House um, sponsors amendments as well, that the PSC can deny certain projects if they're not cost effective. In this last line, the House sponsor um, amendments authorize a utility company to bid on the PJM wholesale market for projects, the Senate sponsor, sponsors amendment, excuse me, do not incorporate that authorization. So the point of this is there's a connection between access to um, projects and capital and the, the price and volatility of, of, of procuring certain energy capacity. So the intent behind this was to ensure um, and maybe that is a policy question that the benefit to ratepayers could be um, higher if there's this ability to bid competitively on the PJM wholesale market. So this kind of paragraph sums it up. We're looking at a question of cost effective generally versus cost effectiveness specifically and the authority of the PSC to authorize a utility company to bid on the PJM wholesale market. Those are the key differences, and please just be mindful that there is a, a, a co-sponsor amendment um, that we would have to adopt on the Senate bill as well. Senator Augustine, you want to weigh in here as well? Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. First of all, I just want to just back up from all the amendment discussion and everything else and just go back to the bill itself. And this bill is about... Um, us setting targets for storage, energy storage, big batteries, y'all, like big batteries. We, we passed legislation in here on offshore wind, for example, which is a, um, you know, it's an intermittent source of power, which, is, which makes a lot of sense. And all that, that really what this bill is about is the other side of that which is we get this intermittent power, we've got a place to store it, and we have a plan that gets us to that. And that, that place where we're able to store it, then we're able to use it in a better way um, when we need it. Because that's what, of course, happens when you got these intermittent sources. You know, we, we, we got to find a place um, in order to uh, have it ready for us when we need it. The, so that's like the big news on the bill. The amendments that 
you know, that I'm comfortable with and that, and we've talked through, that I've talked through with folks is to say in keeping with what we did on offshore wind and other things, let's just make sure that when we do this, that it makes sense from a cost standpoint, that there's a test that says what we're doing is cost effective. And if it's not cost effective, then we, we don't do it. We change it. We move it down. I just think that's the, you know, I think that's just smart and good policy that we do. And the second part is let's make sure we go after all that federal money that's out there. And let's just put that in the statute. We're going to go after the money um, that is out there so that we're going to go after the money uh, that's out there and we're going to do it in a cost effective way, but that this will be an extremely important part of our transition to clean power um, that we're doing. And that, and so I would, you know, I would just ask for you all to, I would move the, the sponsor amendment and the Senate amendments um, because I think it's clean. I think it does what it needs to do. And um, I just would ask for your support of it. Okay, any questions for Alexis or for Senator Augustine on uh, the possibility of, well, I think we have a motion to move the Senate amendments plus that sponsor amendment we referenced earlier. Any discussion, questions before we take that up? Yes, uh, Senator Washington and Senator, uh, Senator Simonier. Do the sponsor amendments include this authorizes a utility company to bid? Because I have some un unreadiness there. Okay, okay, already, I'm fine. Yeah, is there a second on the uh, motion? Okay, we have a favorable and a second on the uh, those the amendments from the Senate. And uh, Senator Simonier, you had a question? Yeah, just in general. Um, so I was reading some of the testimony and I don't have the history that you have on this. And I understand some utilities back, I think in 19 started a pilot program for battery storage. And like, I think bg and &E just got it up and running one this year. And it was very small amount of battery compared to what this bill is doing. I think the fiscal note says this is like 325 times bigger. Um, so I always go back to the rate payer and I know you're concerned about them as well. And I see that they're talking, this is like a $3.8 billion project. And I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, that the rate payers are gonna be the ones that bear the majority of this cost. So start with that and then I can ask you some other questions. So again, I'm going to go back to the cost effectiveness language that I made sure that we had. We're going to make sure, and if you, and we, and was sent around to you all, hopefully you all received it. Um, there were some reports that were done that show that um, when, and when we make the move, if we're able to get more solar going, um, that it will make the storage cost effective. In other words, it'll cost us a little bit less than if we continued with the natural gas, the natural gas investments and all that other stuff. Like that's a part of the cost effectiveness discussion is to just to make sure that when we are doing these things, we're empowering, you know, the folks PSC and everybody to look at it and say, this makes sense versus the path where you know, right now there still is a lot, you know, each year the gas folks got to invest all this money, 500 million. I think they've talked about, you know, over time, but that's the test that will occur. The test will say this going down this route, the combination of solar plus whatever other RPS uh, um, energy that's out there plus storage is, doesn't cost our rate payers more. Like that's what it's, that's what that, that's why I added that language in there. If I can, just so I understand it, because that was one of my next questions. What does sure. cost effective mean? So mm -hmm. looking the way the, the state's going, it's basically getting more electrification and renewables and less gas. And yes. so obviously there's investment money that you have for the gas. So are you saying that they would invest less in the gas because we're providing more through the battery of the renewable and the solar. And you're saying that's in the bill 
to protect the rate payer so the rates won't be going up. That's great. Okay. Now, the other question I, I did have is, you know, when you first start with batteries, because this seems it, it's at the beginning, the price is very high. And as you build more, it comes down. So just a question, I know we want to be leaders, but being a leader, it would also seem that we're paying the higher cost to help get the, the quantity. Um, was that considered at all? The cost, yes. So the cost, it's it's like other things. It, this cost has already come down quite a bit. And actually, if you look at the um, the requests for um, at, at PJM for new projects, you'll see that the other projects, the the, the gas projects, things like that, those are being canceled because they're just not penciling anymore. The money is not there. The storage projects uh, and the solar projects are still continuing because they make good financial sense. The costs have come down. The other thing that we did do here is open it up a little bit um, to include other forms of storage that also we're going to make sure that that the costs do are coming down and that they do make sense before we make before we go forward with them. And we're not, you know, others are working this too. I mean, I mean meaning across the country you know, on the storage okay. stuff. We're not like out here on our own on this. Just tell me where that cost effective language is, the amendment, so yes. I can just review it. It is. Is it in the voting list packet? Or? It is. Okay. Page five, line 25. Of the packet. But where is cost effective? If, I mean, I heard your explanation, but where in the bill? I mean, cost effective is a generic term, generally understood, but I want to make, okay, so, I, I like what you said, and I just, as yeah. far as protecting the rate payer. In the, in the one that I'm looking at, Senator, it's actually in, on page, my eyes aren't very good, it's on page six, which says like, kind of like page three at the top, mm -hmm. and, um, and you see where it says there, um, three, you see like on lines eight to 10, and then you go, or the maximum cost-effective amount of energy storage that can be deployed. So what that says is that if it cannot be deployed in a cost-effective way, we don't do it. Okay. Additional questions for uh, Alexis or for Sarah Augustine? Um, Yes, uh, uh, Senator Brooks and then Senator Washington. And then yes, Senator yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, Senator. Also, there should be some savings realized, like from right, right now with a capacity market. When you, when you've got storage, then there would that there could mean that there could be less need for for capacity in that sense because now we're paying for, in many cases, uh, for. Uh, Electrons that's not being generated, mm -hmm. yeah. But with battery storage, you know, then you know that that should have reduced that need because it's there for you. And mm -hmm. and then here again, that should help keep those particular costs down when you don't have to ramp up with a you know with a carbon base or gas, you know. So so that 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 in itself should should help uh, mitigate s some of the costs that. Uh, that, that, that we are concerned about. So I, I think it's a good bill. I yes. agree. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Senator Washington. Yeah, I just, since we're asking questions, I, I want to better understand number three that was, you know, page, oh, I guess line 28, uh, 29, page three, where it was, looks like it was, we struck allowing power purchase agreements to competitively bid. I guess I wanted to understand what that means. I'm getting some information that says that allows revenue to be generated and that goes to the customers. Um, so I'm trying to understand. Can you just be specific when you say page, are you talking about page three of the, the oh, reprint? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, what not are you the talking? reprint. Um, um, it, would be, it, it would correspond to this House Amendment proposed that authorizes a utility company to bid. And I think we struck it in the, or they struck it. Um, on page three of the original. Thank you. Maybe bill. page six of the reprint, Senator. Okay. Page six, lines seventeen through twenty. Okay. You say so. 
<laughs> I just Senator, yeah, you're just asking about that? the power yeah. purchase agreements. Is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, I just want to I want to understand is that the same as this amendment that authorizes a utility company to no, they're different. They're so different. They are different. But the okay. power purchase agreement is a mechanism where like they that you it, it is what it says. You know, they buy a, it's a contract to buy power over time. This doesn't, you know, this is just pulling that out. It doesn't say that, um, you know, because a lot of times folks are not comfortable being tied into those long-term contracts. If you think about it too, like, let's say the cost of, of the power may go up or might, you know, or go down. And so it just allows for better flexibility. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Additional questions? Uh, Senator Kagan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also had, as Senator Simon Air did, I also had questions about cost effective, but I had one more question. Uh, you referenced, and in the reprint, page six, after line 20, the inserted section about requiring that folks make, um, that the, that the, uh, that the, mm -hmm. I, well, well, companies, yes. I don't know what <laughs> noun to use, uh, make reasonable efforts to apply for all applicable state and federal grants, rebates, tax credits, loan guarantees, and other similar benefits as the benefits become available. And like Senator Simon Air, the impact on that would be huge for the ratepayers, for the customers, because if they're getting a bunch of support from another other resources, then they don't have to charge as much to our constituents. That's the point of the amendment. Which I love. Yeah. I wonder what incentive or enforcement there is. So there's applying and pursuing because it's really in you know their best interest, or they can check the box, but not really put a lot of juice into it. How does that go that we know that they're really doing their darndest? Well, uh, it, it, it will be a part of the program that's developed. Um, with the PSC says that they will incorporate that. I mean, that's their job to make sure that they actually are pursuing and that they're living up to what the plan will be. So the PSC would have oversight mm -hmm. to make sure that they're really rigorously applying, pursuing and. Yeah. And, okay. that, and, and that's PSC, a part of you're in the room. <laughs> you're on the record. Okay. Lisa Smith. Okay. <laughs> and that does not need to be clarified. No, that's that's is, just, that, that is clear. clarifying. That's okay. the whole, that was the point of it okay. to make sure that they know that this is what we are requiring that they do. Perfect. Thank yeah. you, Senator. Appreciate mm -hmm. the explanation. Yes. Yeah, Senator Simon. Since you guys know this stuff, how long <laughs> is the capacity to hold this energy? Yeah. So once you store it, I want to say that this is a four hour, but I, we can, I don't know, we've done this before. I, there might be someone who knows it better that might be able to help. Do we have any uh, energy storage folks uh, in the, could answer Senator Simon Air's question? Mm -hmm. So basically, how long can it hold and how much do you lose typically because you can't use it quick enough? Thank you for the question, um, Senator and, and committee. Uh, Noah, tell us who you are. Yes, yeah. my name is Noah Roberts. I am the Director of Energy Storage at the American Clean Power Association. Um, so the, the technology can store the electricity for as long as it, it would like, the operators would like and then discharge it when it's needed or when it's most economical. The duration uh, that, that can be uh, supplied, um, we see standard technologies uh, in utility scale batteries averaging about four hours, um, but this bill does not specify uh, duration of the technologies that we would be deployed. That would be determined uh, based on cost effectiveness and uh, usefulness to the grid. Thank you. Okay, additional questions? Yeah, Senator we're Augustine, good. we're good. Okay, we had a motion and a second. Just to uh, thank you guys. You can yeah. retreat back to your, you, you did your job. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, Alexa, just process-wise, if we take the Augustine amendments and, you, and there was a Hester sponsor amendment as yeah. well, uh, can we take, can if we adopt those amendments, can they just can put them on right. both bills to conform the bills That's together right. so we can take one vote? I mean, that doesn't present any problems, issues, or anything of that nature? Yeah, it's a, 
adopt, then move to conform the Senate to the House. Maybe two separate motions, but I think. Okay, should... well, let's take up the amendments from Senator Augustine, um, and then we'll include the sponsor amendment from Senator Hester, correct, in one vote. So, any, uh, we have a motion, a second. We have a favorable motion from Senator Kagan. Is there a second from Senator Augustine? Discussion? Okay, all in favor of those uh, adopting those amendments, raise your hand. All opposed? Amendments carry unanimously. Um, let's take up uh, the bill, uh, Senator Augustine's bill 697 as amended. Is there a motion from Senator Augustine? Second. Second, Senator Kagan. Uh, okay, discussion? All, of, <clears throat> all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Okay, we... Uh, we have a yeah we have a descending view. Let's do a roll call on this one. Uh, again, we're on Senate Bill uh, 697 as amended, and we're going to do a roll call. Favorable motion. All right, Senator Kagan. Aye. Senator Kagan, yes. Senator Augustine. Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion. The cost effective language kind of gives me some comfort, but I just still just just that one line in that uh, redone uh, fiscal note says. Uh, the scale of potential expenditures and associated cost recovery on taxpayers is worth consideration. So when in doubt, I'm, I'm going to be voting no at this time. Thank you. Senator Gallion, no. Senator Watson? Yes. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young? Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? No. Senator Carosa, no. Senator Hester? Yes. Senator Hester, yes. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Washington, yes. Senator Simonair? Yes. Senator Simonair, yes. And Senator Feldman? Uh, yes, 697 carries 9 to 2. Um, and let's have a motion to conform the House bill to what we just passed. We, we've got uh, Senator Augustine as motion. Is there a second from yes. Senator Kagan? Uh, move to conform. Let's just, again, let's do another roll call on this one. We're, uh, again, on the House bill, which is uh, House Bill 910. And this motion is to conform what we just did on 697 to conform House right. Bill 910 to that. So, Senator Kagan? Aye. Senator Kagan, yes. Senator um, Augustine? Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion? No. Senator Gallion, no. Senator Watson? Yes. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young? Yes. Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? No. Senator Carosa, no. Senator Hester? Senator Hester, yes. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Washington, yes. Senator Simonair? Senator Simonair, yes. And Senator Feldman? Yes, that motion carries nine to two. Um, and now let's, um, do we need to do a separate, um, I don't think we need to, do we need to move now that the bill, the amendments conform? I think we do need to do a second uh, vote favorable um, on the conform version or is that, is it conform? Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're, I think we're good, good to go yeah. on that. Okay. Um, that brings us to our final bill for today, and let's turn to the topic of uh, paint stewardship, uh, Senate Bill 260, and we're going to go to April for this piece of legislation, Senate okay. Bill 260. Senate Bill 260, Maryland Paint Steward Stewardship. This bill requires a producer of architectural paint sold at retail in the state or a representative organization acting on behalf of a producer to one submit by July 1st, 2024, a plan for the establishment of a paint stewardship program to the Maryland Department of the Environment for approval Two, pay a plan review fee to the department. Three, implement the program with, within six months after plan approval Four, submit annual reports for review by the department. Five, pay annual report review fees to the department. Um, the bill establishes a uniform paint stewardship assessment for architectural paint sold in the state to cover program cost and a prohibition on the sale of architectural paint unless the producer or its representative is implementing an approved paint stewardship program. Um, specified existing penalty provisions apply to violations of the bill. There are amendments, um, two of them are in your bill packet and one is um, separate on your desk. All of these are being offered by Senator Hester. The first is on page two of the bill packet. Um, this would require in that annual report from the representative organization that they the report disaggregate data on the volume of post-consumer paint collected by county. Um, and that that report also include the total fees um, collected, disaggregated by county. 
The next amendment is on page three of your voting packet, also from Senator Hester. Um, this will require the Department of the Environment to make a determination that the proposed plan and assessment um, pro provided by the Paint Stewardship Organization demonstrates a net benefit compared to the collection programs available to consumers in 2022 before approving the plan and assessment. And then the final loose um, amendment on your desk would require the department to review costs and benefits of a program um, and report its findings and recommendations to this committee and the Environment and Transportation Committee on or before December 1st, 2027. Hey, Senator Hester, why don't you, if you want to add, again, we've got basically on um, the amendment pack at page two, one amendment, a second one on page three, and then we have this standalone um, amendments that um, is, again, standalone. So one, if you want to add to what April did a brief description, if you want to add the rationale from where you sit of these three separate um, matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on the First Amendment um, that requires the reporting, you know, by each county, I was just, you know, thinking, thinking about this bill and if we had, okay, so we know how much, you know, money is coming in and how much pain is coming in, but we don't know where exactly it is. And it had occurred to me that you could have, you know, a, a lot of the paint, you know, being recycled in one county. And so I just thought that adding, a, they've got to collect this data anyways, just to ask for a breakdown kind of made sense to me, make sure nobody's coming over from like West Virginia to recycle their paint for free and um, in Garrett County, something like that. So that was the purpose of the first one. Why don't you just go through the second one and then the standalone uh, okay. document? The the second one um, in the line, uh, in line with, um, you know, Senator Augustine looking for, um, you know, net benefit. Um, and kind of a cost comparison. In this part of the bill, it, it basically says that it, that the department shall approve the program if all of the things outlined on the previous section are done. And I thought it might just also be good to check that the program is still kind of a net benefit compared to where we were in 2022. So things are getting better. Um, and provided they are, then the department would go ahead and, and, and approve the plan. Um, the last one, which is the standalone one, um, you know, really gets to the fact that we're seeing, you know, in some places, innovation around extended producer responsibility. And there's different ways to do this. This paint model is one model that has worked well in some states. You know, we're one of four states that's trying this new packaging EPR. Um, and so what this asks is that four years from now, once we've had, you know, this program and hopefully the EPR program working, we circle back and we say, hey, is this still the most, you know, are we getting the most bang for our buck with this specific model um, four years hence? And just asking for a report that be given back to this committee in four years on how this program compares to, um, you know, other programs uh, in our surrounding states. Um, and, and with these three amendments, I would feel much more comfortable um, voting yes on the bill. Okay, discussion, either the underlying bill or the Hester amendments. So this is the time for dis discussion. Yes, yeah, Senator Gallion. I, I'm just to clarify, um, I know when we talk about counties and states, sometimes Baltimore City's included, but I'm assuming that it is under this. Okay, that's I, I thought so, but I just want to double check. Okay, further questions? Uh, Sen uh, Sen Senator Carosa, then Senator Kagan. So I know in the past we've had this bill before and the real re retailers have opposed it. Have Have any of their issues been addressed? understanding is that the retailers still oppose it. Um, I mean, ultimately, this program, and, and it is operating, I think, in 11 other states now, it does um, involve the addition of an assessment on these cans of paint. Um, so in other states, it's been about 75 cents added per gallon of paint. Um, but that's basically the retailer's concern with it is that they would have to that they're they're going to be charging this additional fee on each um, can of paint sold. 
Okay, so that, 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 that I think that boils down to that, Senator Carrozza, that 75 cent per gallon assessment is, I think, largely the reason, rationale um, for their opposition. I don't believe anybody else has expressed opposition, but that said, um, any additional questions, comments? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. I'm just Senator, Senator, wait. No, I have no, Senator Kagan had a question, but we'll. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Who did I miss over here? It was Senator Carrozza. Did you have a question? Okay, Senator Kagan. Yeah. I have a question, Senator Hester. Um, if we want to see whether something is, I guess I'm not quite sure about why we need to take a look as we're starting it when we have the capacity to pass legislation to modify or end a program. Well, they kind of look like they're, they they look like they complement each other. One is it's got to make a difference. And the other is tell us if it's making a difference. Isn't that about what they do? So, yes, understood. Can you, yeah, I guess I'm just a little confused as to why. If it's happening in 11 other states and the data shows that it's working, do we need to have a report? Do we need to go back and kind of start a program with the assumption that we need to? Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little confused by the amendment. I will tell you bluntly that this program has been around for a while. In, in Maryland, my, in elsewhere. Elsewhere. Right. It does okay. not, in my mind, represent the future of where we're going. Because in this program, the consumers pay all of the costs, right? Whereas in the other EPR programs, the manufacturers pay some of the cost. So I am not a huge fan of this program because I think it's slightly outdated. I think that, but, but I do understand that these states work together and that it's good for us to be like consistent. But who knows, in four years, maybe we get all the, all the states to change the programs and the manufacturers are paying a tad bit more. Okay, thank you for the answer. Okay, additional discussion. Okay, just to be clear, we did have a motion. We're talking about the Hester uh, package of amendments. If somebody wants to separate out one, this is the time to do so. Otherwise, we one vote will uh, count for the package of Hester amendments. Okay, is that clear to everybody? Yes, Senator Carroza. So we could, you're saying, yes, we well, can separate got, out. You could separate one out. We'll take separate votes. But okay. so just so we're clear, um, we've got, Again, the amendment on uh, page two of the packet, separate one on page three, and then this document, uh, which is standalone, which is, I guess, a third potential separate vote uh, or separate conversation or discussion. So, so if somebody wants to separate any one of these three options um, out, um, that's perfectly appropriate. Otherwise, we'll do a yes. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about the one on the collecting by county, the page two, Senator Carroza? Yes. Okay, so we're going to separate that out, and we'll leave that. Um, so the other two, the standalone and what's on page three, we can take up as one vote, and then we'll separately vote. Um, I don't want there to be confusion. Separately vote the amendment that is on page two of the packet dealing with collection by each county. Senator Carrozza, just to be clear, that's the one that you want separated out. The amendment that talks about uh, the total fees collected in state by each county, that amendment is the one you want separated out. Okay, so everybody understands that. Okay, well, let, that's, yeah, uh, right, so Senator that Kagan. Separated out. That's we can ask about that. Correct. So why don't we put that aside? We'll vote that last. The other two amendments, uh, we're going to take, a, we have a motion Let's redo this, Senator Augustine. You had a motion on these other two amendments, and Sir Washington seconded it. So, on just those amendments, um, discussion. Okay. All in favor of those amendments, raise your hand. Okay. All all opposed. Those amendments carry. Now we have that one separated out amendment. And Sir Croza, would you like to speak to that amendment that you've separated out again? On page two of the packet, the total fees collected state by each county as determined by an independent financial audit funded by the paint stewardship 
assessment that uh, would you like to speak to that one way or the other i just want to said by each county and i haven't had a chance to consult my county so i'm that's why i'm voting no that one let's do um let's just do a roll call vote on that one amendment and we'll see where we are so there's a motion yeah we're gonna need a motion yes senator kagan on that amendment there would be 24 independent financial audits that would be conducted senator Esther. So my understanding is that the financial auditor is collecting all this information anyways. So they're they're going around, they're getting all this data and they're giving us one big number. And so what I'm asking for is can we have the details? Can we know how where the fees are being spent and where the paint is being deposited? Disaggregated by county. Yes. Is that what the bill is that what the amendment actually says April you might want to just to clarify um rather than saying by an independent financial audit say by the independent financial audit because that, that's already part of the bill that's what I that was my intent yeah okay did everybody get that that slight technical adjustment to clarify that verbiage okay that will be what we're going to now vote on by amendment that uh suggestion from council okay we need a separate motion for uh on this one amendment Senator Augustine Senator Washington, you're second on this. Okay, let's do another roll call because it's not. All right, yes. Senator. Is there? Hold on, Senator Kagan looks. I'm pained. sorry. I, yes. Let's just let's just do a scenario here. We get the total amount. We get it divided by 24 counties. It's going to say that Montgomery County has more people who pay their houses because we have more people, and that Somerset County has fewer people who paint their houses because they have fewer people. I mean, what is this going to give us that's going to help us evaluate the program? I think I was curious whether anybody from our neighboring states would be bringing their paint to recycle it in our counties that border other states. Wow. Why does that matter? And what would that mean? How would we change your program? We're going to look at someone's driver's license before we let them drop off their paint cans? They've got the data anyway. It's not going to cost them anything to give us the data. Well, well we're having an independent financial audit. They're you doing have to it anyways. Auditors. They're going to have the data. It's one audit. They're going to have the data. I just want it split into 24 pieces. Okay, Senator Simon Air, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think one other benefit from this, you would see which counties are using it more. It's not how many people paint their houses. It's how many people are utilizing this program. And so if one's using it much better, you could, and the others aren't, you could say you could have a better outreach program or something to let people know about it. So I think that data could help there as well. Okay. Any further discussion about this amendment? Okay. We had a motion a second. We'll take a roll call. There seems to be... Um, some dissent or otherwise. Lamoria, um, on this. One thing. All right, Senator Kagan. Amendment. I don't think it's necessary. I'm voting no. Senator Kagan, no. Senator Augustine? Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion? <laughs> Senator Gallion, Gallion, yes. Senator Watson? Yes. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young? Yes. Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? Senator Carosa, no. Senator Hester? Yes. Senator Hester, yes. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Washington, yes. Senator Simonier? Senator Simonier, yes. And Senator Feldman? Yes. Amendment carries nine to two. We now have uh, Senate Bill uh, 270 as amended in front of us. Is there any motion on this? Senate Bill 260. I'm sorry, 260. What did I say? 70. Oh, 260. Senate Bill 260 as amended. Okay, Senator Augustine, second from Senator Kagan. Let's do a roll call on this piece of legislation. Again, Senate Bill 60 as amended. Senator Kagan. Sorry. Well, before we do that, discussion. Did it was you were oh, okay. Apologize. Let's let's go back to the roll call here. Yeah. Senator Kagan. Hi. Senator Kagan, yes. Senator Augustine. Yes. Senator Augustine, yes. Senator Gallion. No. Senator Gallion, no. Senator Watson. Yes. Senator Watson, yes. Senator Lewis Young. Senator Lewis Young, yes. Senator Brooks? Yeah. Senator Brooks, yes. Senator Carosa? Yeah. Senator Carosa, no. Senator uh, Hester? Yes. Senator Hester, yes. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Washington, yes. Senator Simonair? Yeah. 
Senator Salmonier, no. And Senator Feldman? Uh, yes, uh, bill carries eight to three. And that concludes our voting for today. Um, tomorrow we will have